Welcome to the Pleasant Green Missionary Baptist Church Sunday School Lesson for Sunday, May 12th, Mother's Day. We are still in Unit 3, which from the Standard Commentary is entitled, Call to Life in Christ. The lesson has three major divisions after the introduction. The first is, which walk? And that's covered between Romans chapter 8, verses 1 to 5. The second is fleshly walk. That's covered between Romans 8, verses 6 to 10. And the third is spiritual walk. And that's covered between Romans 8, 11, and 14. From the standard, the lesson title is Call to Life in the Spirit. Call to Life in the Spirit. An additional lesson aims are number one. State two benefits for those who live by the Spirit. Number two, explain Paul's distinction between living by the Spirit and living by the flesh. And then number three, identify a specific area where he or she is not living according to God's Spirit and make a plan to change. The standard has three major divisions as well. The first is, number one, the law of the Spirit. That's covered between Romans 8, 1 to 4. The second is indwelling of the Spirit, covered between verses 5 and 11. And the third is leading of the Spirit, and that's covered between verses 12 and 14. And in the way of uh, introduction, um, we... Uh, in our last lesson, uh, we could sum it up uh, by concluding that all have sinned and come short of God's glory or his righteousness, his righteous standard. And in the chapters in between uh, chapter 3 and chapter 8, which is uh, where our lesson text is taken from today, uh, Paul goes on to talk about uh, Abraham's call and how he was uh, not called under the law. In fact, uh, he was uh, called before the law, hundreds of years before the law was given by Moses. Uh, but he, his faith was accounted to him as righteousness. We see that in uh, Romans 4 and 3, and that was... Uh, basically a quote from Genesis 15 and 6. Abraham's righteousness was accounted to him for faith, and he was, of course, called before the circumcision was given. Uh, Abraham was a Gentile when he was called, by, and, and, of course, justified by faith. Paul goes on uh, in the chapter that immediately precedes chapter 8, chapter 7, and talking about the struggles of the flesh and the spirit, uh, the law of the, the flesh and the spirit, and how that is a, an ongoing uh, battle within uh, him and, and actually within every believer. And he concludes chapter 7 with verse 25 by thanking God. He said, I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Uh, so then, with the mind, I myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh, the law of sin. And I gave that, I read that verse because our lesson text begins at uh, verse 1 of chapter 8, which uh, includes a therefore. There is therefore uh, now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. We're going to go ahead and read through our lesson text, and then we'll have some verse-by-verse -verse discussion. Verse 2 then reads, For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do, in that it was weak through the flesh, God sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh for sin, condemned sin in the flesh, 
that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. For they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh, but they that are after the Spirit the things of the Spirit. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace, because the carnal mind is enmity against God. For it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. So then, they that are in the flesh cannot please God. Verse 9, But ye are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if so be that the Spirit of God dwell in you. Now if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. And if Christ be in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the Spirit is life because of righteousness. But if the Spirit of him that raised Jesus from the dead dwell in you, he that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies by his Spirit that dwelleth in you. Therefore, brethren, we are debtors not to the flesh to live after the flesh. For if we live after the flesh, ye shall die. But if ye through the Spirit do mortify the deeds of the body, ye shall live. For as many as are debtors, so as many as are led rather by the Spirit of God, are the sons of God. And our key verse is uh, verse 1. There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus. So let's jump right in um, with verse 1 again. And, and let's look at, uh, let's break that down. Uh, part A of verse 1 says, There is therefore no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus. Of course, if you've spent any time studying the Bible, you know that whenever you start a passage that begins with therefore, you need to find out what the therefore is there for. So the therefore really connects with the prior chapter, chapter 7, and it, it basically uh, uh, talks about the, the powerlessness uh, that we have over the three tyrants that Paul actually uh, describes in prior verses. Those, those uh, tyrants, terrifying tyrants, the commentator calls them, or... Uh, that uh, these are tyrants to all humanity, or sin, number one, the law, number two, and death. And we know that sin uh, results in death, uh, not just physical death, but spiritual death, eternal separation from God. And the law, of course, is what condemns, because we are unable to keep the law perfectly we are therefore contempt condemned to death now what this part a of uh, verse 1 says there is therefore no condemnation no condemnation to or for them which are in Christ Jesus what does that mean it means there is no punishment uh, we are indeed guilty of sin, but our sin has been paid for, and we are escaping the sentence of eternal death, that is, eternal separation from God. And, of course, that is synonymous with being justified. We are being given a right standing, though guilty, we are not being held uh, accountable for our sins. But what's the requirement? The requirement is that we be in Christ Jesus or we be identified with him. Uh, we be a part of his body and, of course, his spirit indwell us. We're going to say more about that as we go on. Now, the, the com one of the commentators, the commentator of the standard, makes a, a point of uh, distinguishing uh, a pardon, which we have been uh, we've been pardoned by God, uh, an exoneration. Uh, a pardon, if you accept a pardon, uh, you're basically uh, acknowledging your guilt. Uh, 
Uh, you're guilty, but you're being pardoned of that guilt uh, and therefore will not be judged because of that guilt. Exoneration means that you were never guilty, you were falsely accused, and therefore uh, you're being uh, relieved or uh, you're avoiding the punishment uh, for something that you did not do. But we are indeed guilty and we were pardoned of that guilt. Part B uh, of verse 1 says, Who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. Now I'm going to go back and forth between the King James Version and the New International Version. I think we get uh, a little clearer language uh, from the NIV. Uh, and Part B uh, of the NIV says, uh, Because... Well, we'll look at we'll look at the NIV when we get to verse two here. But when it says walk, of course, we are talking about uh, lifestyle. We're talking about uh, a, uh, a, a, a our behavior, our daily and routine behavior. So, uh, what what is it actually saying? It's saying that we don't walk uh, by the um, uh, in accordance with our fleshly desires, we're not controlled by our fleshly desires. We're not dominated by our fleshly desires. We not we walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. But we're actually controlled by the spirit. The spirit has dominion in our lives. Verse two says, "For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and death." Now, you know, Paul opens with four, and that introduces his reasoning for the claims uh, he makes in the previous verse, which is uh, basically there are two laws. Uh, you know, one is uh, the law of the spirit of life in Christ, and the other is the law of sin that leads to to death and and these are are two laws that uh, have consequences uh, the law of the spirit of life means the spirit control life leads to eternal life that is eternal life and of course the law of sin or the the, the, the law that convicts us of sin and of course sin that is unpardoned or unforgiven leads to death now, you know, when, when, when Paul uses these expressions, the law of the spirit of life or the law of sin and death, uh, you know, he, is, he uses uh, these, uh, this language elsewhere, Romans 3.27a, uh, and, remember, and he uses in Romans 3.27b also in reference to works, uh, he uses it... Uh, uh, in other contexts, uh, in Romans 7:23, the prior chapter, he talks about the law of sin, which is in our members. But the uh, probably better understanding of how it is used in this verse is it means dominion. It means uh, something that has dominion in our lives. And the and the King James, I'm sorry, the the New International version uh, basically uh, reads because through Christ Jesus the law of the spirit who gives life has set you free from the law of sin and death we are in the realm if you will or the dominion under the dominion of the spirit uh, or we are under the dominion of the law which of course convicts of sin and that sin leads to death. Now, the agent of the uh, what leads to eternal life or life, and this this life that's spoken of here, spirit of life, is eternal life in Christ Jesus, is of course the Holy Spirit. He is the one that leads us to acceptance of the 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 the, the payment of the 
the pen for our penalties for our sins that Christ has already made. Verse three. For what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh, God sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin condemned sin in the flesh. So what is what is Paul saying here? He's saying uh, the law, for, for what the law could not do uh, in that it was weak through the flesh. Now, you know, I, I've, uh, I've I've actually mentioned this several times in uh, my Sunday school class at church. Uh, uh, I've actually talked about the, the purpose of the law, at least one of the main purposes of the law uh, was basically to to let us know um, what God's righteous standards are and to let us know what is sinful and what isn't, what is righteous. In other words, it, it is not it was never intended to save us, but it was intended to bring us to recognition of our sin, the rec- of the recognition of uh, the weakness in this case of our flesh. Now, there is nothing wrong with the law. In fact, we'll say a little more about this later. You know, Jesus said he didn't come to condemn the law, but to fulfill the law. And we'll explain how he did that. And Paul says that the law is good and holy in Romans 7, 12. Uh, the, what the problem is, uh, the weak link is our ability or inability, if you will, to keep the law. You know, our fleshly nature prevents us from complete adherence to the law. And I've, I've actually shared that the law is like a mirror. Uh, a mirror can show you. If you've been working out in the yard and you got some dirt on your face, the mirror can show you you've got dirt on your face. But the mirror cannot wash that dirt off your face. Something else has to wash. You have to, to wash that dirt off your face. Well, the cleansing agent, uh, in our case, the, the one that washed away our sins is the Lord Jesus Christ. But the law actually showed us our sins. So the verse goes on to say what the law could not do because of the weakness of our flesh. God sending his son, his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, in the likeness of sinful flesh. Now, uh, if you'd seen Jesus in uh, the days of his earthly ministry, he would have looked like any other Jewish man, young Jewish man. Uh, he and one might have assumed he was sinful just like the rest of us. But though he looked like a regular Jewish man, he was without sin, completely and totally without sin. And he kept the law perfectly. And because he kept the law perfectly, he fulfilled the requirements of the law. OK, so his perfect righteousness in keeping the law was imputed to us. And, and so the verse says, uh, sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh for sin, condemned sin in the flesh. He in bodily form incarnate actually kept the law perfectly and therefore was able to condemn sin by being perfectly sinless. That, of course, leads to death. And that righteousness was imputed to us, was credited to our account. And therefore, we have a standing before God. Therefore, the law cannot condemn us because we stand clothed in his righteousness. He was able to keep the law perfectly and we stand in his righteousness and therefore not condemned. Now, when you get a moment, you might look at 2 Corinthians 5, 21, uh, which emphasizes the fact that Christ was truly human, uh, but he, he was without sin. Uh, also, you can look at Hebrews uh, chapter 2, verses 14 and verse 17. Let's look at verse 4. That the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. What's he saying here? 
He's saying the righteous requirements of the law. Again, the law shows us God's righteousness and as a result, our sinfulness or our inability to to um, to measure up to his righteous standards. Uh, now, when it says they are uh, they're not fulfilled in us, uh, he's he's saying we are not able certainly to keep to measure up to the righteous. However, we are beneficiaries of the righteousness that Christ actually was able, his righteousness, he was able to keep the righteous standards of the law. Now, and it says, um, who walk again, not after the flesh, but after the spirit. If we are in the dominion of, under the dominion of the spirit uh, and not of our fleshly desires, uh, then this applies to us. Uh, his righteousness, uh, God, his righteousness was imputed to us or he fulfilled righteousness for us, the righteousness that we could not fulfill. Now, when, when we talk about being under the, the dominion of the spirit, we mean walking by the direction or guidance of the spirit and not our own fleshly desires being empowered by him to walk as God wants us to uh, walking by his enablement. When, when we're told to walk in the spirit and we will not obey the lust of the flesh, we mean or the, the Lord means to walk by the enablement of the spirit or the power of the spirit and not rely on our own to resist, uh, the lust of our flesh. Verse 5. For they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh. And let's go to the NIV uh, and read that verse again. And it says, Those who live according to the flesh have their minds set on what the flesh desires. But those who live in accordance with the spirit have their minds set on what the spirit desires are those who live under the dominion of the spirit have their minds set on what the spirit desires. Uh, that's uh, hopefully uh, pretty clear. And Paul gives some examples in uh, Galatians chapter five, verses 19 to 21 of what the flesh desires. And uh, let's just take a quick look at some of those things. Galatians chapter 5, beginning at verse 19, says, Now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these, adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envyings, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like. Of the which I tell you before, as I have also told you in time past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Those are controlled by or under the dominion of the flesh and the fleshly desires, which I named some of. Paul says, and such like, meaning that there are others. Now, uh, I read uh, part A. Uh, of five Let's, part b of course i read the entire verse from the niv but going back to uh the kjv it says but they that are after the spirit the things of the spirit in other words they mind the things of the spirit or uh, as the uh, uh niv says live in accordance with the spirit and what are some of those things well, let's go a little further in Galatians chapter 5 and read verses 22 uh, to 25 very quickly. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. No law applies, in other words. And they that are Christ have uh, crucified the flesh with the affections and lusts. If we live in the spirit, let us also walk in the spirit. Uh, 
live, our, let our daily lives reflect the influence, the direction, the guidance, and the power of the Spirit, the Holy Spirit. Verse 6a, for to be carnally minded is death. Well, carnally minded and materially minded. Carnal is another word for material or it, carne comes from flesh. Um, the Greek word carne comes from flesh, but it's generally used to be uh, to mean fleshly or materially minded in this case, is to focus uh, on the bodily impulses of the moment. You know, you uh, you see an attractive woman, you know, one of the uh, impulses of the, the natural man is, is to lust, you know. Uh, so the, the, imp, the focus on the impulses of the, of the moment is what is to, is it leads to death. If this is a pattern of your life, Ultimately, it leads to death, Paul is saying here. Uh, it is, uh, and then let's go on, part B says, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. In other words, to focus on what the Spirit desires, what the Spirit uh, leads you to do and say, uh, and uh, is life eternal life okay it's not talking about just physical life it's talking about eternal life and peace and this word peace um, the pagans actually uh, used or they considered peace a, a, a cessation rather or cessation uh, from strife uh, such as uh, uh, the ending of a war or something like that. But it goes beyond that uh, when you look at the Hebrew word, uh, really, which was translated to Greek, uh, shalom, Hebrew word shalom, which uh, not only means uh, uh, cessation or absence of strife, but it also means an inner contentment uh, that results from the blessings of God. When you have a minute, look at Isaiah 48, 18, an inner contentment that results from the blessings of God. Um, 7a, let's look at verse 7a, and it says, because the carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God. Let's read that from the NIV, and actually I'll, I'll read the entire verse. It says, the mind governed by the flesh is hostile to God. It does not submit to God's law, nor can it do so. So it says, again, um, we are talking about being in subjection to or under the dominion of if we are, if we have a carnal or fleshly mind, that is, uh, it is hostile. This word enmity is better translated hostile toward God. And uh, those who are controlled by the flesh are not subject to God's law. They don't care about God's law. You know, and unfortunately. Uh, too many, far too many in this world today uh, could care less about God's law, and they live their lives as if God didn't exist. And I often tell my class, you know, when the when the Bible uses the expression godless, uh, it is not talking about the worst despot you can think about, the, uh, the, the most sinful person you can think about, but it's talking about those people who just do not regard God or his law in their lives. God has no influence on them. And there are so many of those today uh, who are godless and God and they're carnally minded or fleshly minded. They're only interested in those things that they think will satisfy their flesh. And verse eight says, so then they that are in the flesh cannot please God. If you are controlled or under the dominion of your flesh, you cannot please God. How do we how do we please God? Well, 
Hebrews chapter 11 verse 6 tells us what will not please him so we can uh, infer that the opposite pleases him. It reads, but without faith it is impossible to please him, that is God, for he that cometh to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. So we can not only infer, we can basically understand clearly from that verse that our faith pleases God and our diligent seeking of him, seeking a genuinely close and intimate relationship with him through Christ pleases God. But those who are carnally minded or those who are controlled by the flesh, fleshly minded, cannot please God. Because uh, as we uh, have read elsewhere in the scripture, the flesh, the carnal mind, and the spirit are uh, at war or uh, at one another. They're, they're at enmity with one another. Verse 9. But ye are not in the flesh, but in the spirit. If so be that the spirit of God dwell in you. Now if any man have not the spirit of Christ, he is none of his. Now, um, from the, the NIV, that verse reads, You, however, are not in the realm of the flesh, but in the realm of the Spirit, if indeed the Spirit of God lives in you. And, anyone, and if anyone, rather, does not have the Spirit of Christ, they are not, I'm sorry, they do not, rather, belong to Christ. So again, this realm speaks of the dominion again. He's saying, but if you are not in the realm of the flesh, but under uh, or the dominion of the flesh, but in the realm or dominion of the spirit, if, and, and, and that only happens if the spirit of God, which is also the spirit of Christ, is indwelling you, then he says, I'm sorry, he's saying that you, however, you are not uh, in the realm or under the control of, you are under the control or dominion of the Spirit, if the Spirit of God, he says in the first part of that verse, is in you, is indwelling you, and if anyone does not have the spirit of Christ, and they're not different spirits, they're the same spirit, uh, they do not belong to him. Uh, if we are not indwelt by the spirit of God, uh, that is very, he makes it very clear here that we do not belong to Christ. Now, between this verse and the next verse, uh, Paul actually uh, speaks of four facts. He actually expresses four clear facts here. Uh, fact number one is that the Spirit of God indwells the Christian. Uh, there, You are not a Christian if the Spirit of God is not indwelling you. Let's take a look very quickly at 2 Corinthians 1.22. Sorry about that. Um, second, I'm sorry. Uh, second Corinthians uh, five twenty two reads, "Who hath also sealed us and given the earnest of the Spirit in our hearts?" Now this word "earnest" uh, means a down payment. It's like earnest money. If you're going to purchase a house or any significant property. It's customary to put down something on it. The Holy Spirit who indwells every believer is the down payment on something. And actually, let's do turn over to 2 Corinthians 5, 5 as well. And uh, it reads, Now he that hath wrought us from the selfsame is the selfsame God who hath also given us unto us the earnest of the spirit again that is the down payment
on what? What is to be redeemed fully later, and that is our bodies. Our bodies are to be glorified and resurrected uh, uh, as like unto his glorified body. So that's fact one. Fact two is that the lack of the Holy Spirit's presence means a person is none of his. Again, the Holy Spirit is the mark, is the down payment uh, on his chosen people. Let's take a quick look at Ephesians chapter 1, verse 14. Again, that reads, which is the earnest of our inheritance unto the redemption of the purchased possession unto the praise of his glory. The purchased possession, again, is 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 our is us entirely resurrect our spirits of course uh, and our resurrected bodies uh, the, the the process of salvation does not end until we are resurrected and in uh, glory for eternity uh, with the Lord Jesus Christ uh, salvation has three tenses the past tense, which was our justification, our being declared righteous before God, our being pardoned of our sins, that happens one time. Sanctification, that's an ongoing process, which the Holy Spirit is accomplishing in and through us uh, right now and throughout our Christian walk. And then the third phase is yet to come, and that's glorification, the redemption of our bodies. Verse 10. And if Christ be in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the spirit is life because of righteousness. Now, uh, from the NIV, that verse reads, but if Christ is in you, then even though your body is subject to death because of sin, again, the sin leads to death, the spirit gives life because of righteousness. Because of not your own righteousness, but because of the righteousness that was imputed to you. So fact three uh, is, of the four facts, is, is that we have a living, vibrant relationship with God in the here and now. Okay, uh, Jesus said, I came that they might have life and have it more abundantly. That's full and meaningful. That doesn't mean we're going to... Uh, be rich or prosperous in a worldly sense, but full and meaningful life. We can have a rich and vibrant life and relationship with God in the here and now. And this is possible despite the fact that our bodies are dead because of sin, or our bodies are dead in this context to sin. Verse 11, But if the spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you, he that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies by his spirit that dwelleth in you. From the King James Version, I'm sorry, the NIV rather, that reads, And if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal body. That word quickened uh, in the King James Version uh, means life, to give life to your mortal bodies because of his spirit who lives in you. So what's he talking about here? Well, let's look to fact four. Fact four is that the presence of God's spirit assures Christians of resurrection life beyond uh, the day uh, our current mortal bodies expired so we're talking about eternal life we're talking about being raised from the dead to live eternally uh, so so while the the verse seems to imply that he is quickening our mortal bodies because of his spirit in other words our our, our uh, temporal bodies it really means beyond these mortal bodies. He's going to raise uh, these uh, mortal bodies, and they're going to actually be transformed into bodies that are suited for eternity. Uh, and it uh, not to die again. He's talking about raising them uh, 
to eternal life in Jesus Christ. All right. Let's look at verses 12 and 13 together. Therefore, brethren, we are debtors not to the flesh to live after the flesh. For if ye live after the flesh, ye shall die. But if ye through the spirit do mortify the deeds of the flesh, ye shall live. Well, what's he talking about? Uh, debtor. Okay. Uh, when he uses the word debtor, of course, it's it's translated from a word that can mean uh, uh, people that have financial obligations. I mean, such as in Matthew eighteen twenty four. But in this case, uh, we're talking about a moral obligation. Uh, and actually, Paul uh, uses uh, that uh, uh that word that basically implies a moral obligation in the 14th uh, verse of uh, chapter 1 uh, when he says he's debtor to the uh, the Greeks, the barbarians, uh, and so forth. He is a debtor. Uh, he has a moral obligation to preach the gospel to them. Okay, so that's what's being inf inferred here. And, and he's saying uh, we're not... We have no obligation to the flesh. We have no obligation to fulfill the desires of our flesh. But we are to self-mortify or we are to kill, extinguish those desires uh, that we have, those impulsive desires. And I listed uh, the works of the flesh. And they are also, of course, those works are basically prompted by desires initially that manifest themselves or result in the deeds, in the work. So uh, we are to mortify or kill those fleshly desires, and we are to be debtors to the Spirit or by the Spirit. We have a, because of uh, what Christ has done for us and what the Spirit is doing in and through us, we have a moral obligation also uh, to share the gospel with others. Uh, he says, But ye through the Spirit do mortify the deeds of the, of the body. We shall live. We shall have this eternal life. Uh, and then finally, verse 14 says, For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. Those of us who are under the control, under the guidance, uh, under the in, the influence, if you will, uh, and, and, and we are empowered by the Spirit to walk as God wants us to, those of us who are led by the Spirit of God, are His sons. Uh, we're going to take a look at three verses to wrap this up. I'm sorry, two verses, rather, to wrap this up. If you look at, uh, we're going to move ahead to... Uh, uh, Romans 8 and 17, and then uh, Galatians 4 and 7. So Romans 8 and 17 reads, And if children, then, well, let, let me back up. We should read 15 through 17. Uh, for, and these are the three verses that immediately uh, follow our lesson text. For ye have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but ye have received the spirit of adoption. That's the Holy Spirit uh, of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father, uh, Daddy, if you will. Uh, the Spirit himself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. The Spirit is a witness within us that we are indeed his children. And verse 17 says, And if children, then heirs, heirs of God, and joint heirs with Christ, if so be, we suffer with him, that we may also be glorified together. If we, if his spirit is in us, we are indeed a part of him, a part of his body. I often uh, uh, say that we have become partakers of the divine nature through the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. We are part of His family, and we are and we are part of Him through that indwelling. So we are His sons and daughters.
And, I, and then uh, let's turn over to Galatians chapter 4 and 7 real quick. And it reads, Wherefore thou art no more a servant, but a son, and if a son, then an heir of God through Christ. So, and, and if we backed up a couple of verses, uh, we would see, uh, beginning at uh, verse 5, he says, To redeem them that were under the law, that we might receive the adoption of sons. And because ye are sons, God hath sent forth the spirit of his son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father. So we belong to him because of the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. And in, in, in conclusion here, um, this was a this is a very good lesson, and I hope that uh, we understand the the first of all that if we are not indwelt by the Holy Spirit, if the Holy Spirit has no influence in your life, uh, you are none of His. And and while uh, the Holy Spirit may not cause you to uh, to feel um, swells great swellings of emotion. Uh, he will make his presence known to you. He will speak to you. He will warn you about uh, uh, sin. Uh, he will convict. He will convict you of sin. Uh, if he is in you, uh, you will indeed grieve him because of your sin. So he will make his presence known. And I said uh, to some of the prisoners, uh, prisoners we ministered to earlier this week, uh, the more uh, you'll hear from him. More, the more words you get in him, the more guidance he will provide you using that word. As David said, thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. He will bring that word back to your remembrance. And Jesus said in the upper room to his disciples, when he said he was going to send another comforter, he said he's going to bring everything back to your remembrance, everything that I've taught you. And so we are we want to work at submitting ourselves more fully to the Holy Spirit, to his dominion, to being guided by him, to being empowered by him. And we want to be prayerful for his guidance before we do anything. You know, we don't want to do it in our own strength, with our own mind, because we are subject to yield to fleshly desires. And we want to be controlled and guided and directed by the Holy Spirit. May God bless you and may God ever keep you.